Hello, class, and welcome to week six of CIS 4670. Uh, it's a very, very short chapter this week, but we're going to talk about uh, wireless network threats. <clears throat> the chapter is just a handful of pages in length. Uh, wireless is one of those areas that we have to pay attention to because with its expansion and the likelihood of office space being very open, uh, we have to take it <clears throat> into consideration. Excuse me. So we are primarily going to look at the wireless network threats and compare them uh, uh, with the types of attacks that uh, persist out there. We'll, we will be looking at traditional 802.11 as well as Bluetooth vulnerabilities. So as usual on pages. Uh, let's see here, 170 and 171, we have terms, and there's a lot of terms in the Wi-Fi section that you have to pay close attention to uh, because they seem to pop up on a lot of certification exams all the time. So jumping into this, uh, wireless vulnerabilities uh, are uh, threatened because they are open. There's no physical layer media that we have to really encounter. We encounter air. Uh, radio frequency signals are easily intercepted and viewed. Uh, they can be dissected and analyzed. So some of the vulnerabilities that we are going to uh, be particularly concerned with are replay attacks, rogue access points, and evil twins. Rogue access points and evil twins, there's subtle nuance with it. Replay attacks are a kind of access modification that are used to replay a recorded signal in order to attempt to break authentication. Uh, and the most common type that you typically see with this are the old style WEP authentication bypass. Uh, WEP should not be used anymore in any wireless access points or any wireless infrastructure out there. It is just too vulnerable. You might as well just have an open network uh, instead. The um, other types of attacks that you see as far as rogue and evil twins are concerned, uh, it's good to know, the again, the subtle nuance difference uh, between them. A rogue may be added by an attacker. It is basically um, an access point that you put in uh, where it is added by a user wanting to enhance their environment. And the big problem with this is that a user doing so uh, can stand a really good chance that they will implement the same level of security uh, within their organization. So what they're trying to do is basically uh, enhance what they already have. So it's not necessarily malicious from that standpoint um, as much as an evil twin attack is. An evil twin attack is malicious in, um, in nature. This is where I'm going to take a rogue access point. I'm going to mimic an SSID for illegitimate purposes and try to intercept inf intercept information by having you attached to my access point instead of the legitimate access point that is out there. Uh, so we have a lot of vulnerabilities that can occur. Uh, first off and foremost is jamming. Jamming is a type of denial of service attack that can be used against uh, wireless networks and even um, Bluetooth. This is where we basically deny signal. Um, we make so much noise on the frequency range that it is impossible to be used. Um, to simplify network setup, uh, for, especially for a small office, home office, WPS or Wi-Fi protective access can be used. Uh, WPS can be put into two different modes, personal or enterprise. The mode that we are most concerned with is personal. With WPS personal, you are basically putting in a password for the SSID that the 
and client has to be configured with in order for them to attach to the network. It is one single password string. That's it. It is not dual factor authentication. It is not multi factor authentication. And therefore, we can sniff that hash that is being used uh, by WPS and then attempt to reverse it or crack that hash in order to get the password to get onto the, um, the network. Uh, before we get into bluejacking and blue snarfing, though, I wanted to shift gears here because WPS does have a new standard. So what I just talked about with the interception of the hash uh, for WPA, WPA2 personal, uh, can be done with simple hacking tools such as Aircrack. WPA3, which is a stronger um, protocol, uh, uh, developed by the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, has other issues with it. So WPA3 has not been released for very long, and all of a sudden there's been you know four or five different vulnerabilities as part of uh, this suite called the the Dragon Blood vulnerabilities, uh, which are tied around uh, denial of service, uh, side channel attacks. Um, which is not that big of a deal, but it can lead to crashing of your WPA3 network, and as it comes up, a Dragonfly uh, key exchange can be done, and then we can uh, uh, break in and crack into the the network. It, this is the, probably the most important uh, paragraph in this article. Again, this article is done by uh, ZDNet. Um, if a client and AP both support WPA2 and WPA3, an adversary can set up a rogue access point, an evil twin, uh, that only supports WPA2. And this can cause the client or victim to connect using WPA2, get the four-way handshake, and then it can be reversed in order to get up to the WPA3 infrastructure. Okay, It's called a downgrade attack. And that works when WPA3 is configured to work with multiple groups of cryptographic algorithms and authentication suites, such as those used in WPA2. Uh, there's a cache-based side channel attack. Again, side channel attacks are more used for denial of service. Uh, a timing-based side channel attack. Um, so basically... WPA3 is most vulnerable when it's used in conjunction with WPA2 for that purpose. Uh, on to, to bluejacking and blue snarfing. So Bluetooth inherently has some issues with it as well. And that technology is going to be used for creating your own personal area network with uh, your personal devices like your smartphone, your car, uh, the headphones that I'm using to record this. Uh, uh, this lecture right now is using Bluetooth. Um, so it is very popular, and with that popularity, um, there are two additional vulnerabilities that we have to be uh, uh, aware of, bluejacking and blue snarfing. Bluejacking is the sending of unsolicited messages to a device. Think of it like spam. Uh, while this can be annoying and harassing, it's not necessarily um, too malicious. Blue snarfing, on the other hand, is where we gain unauthorized access to the Bluetooth connection, and we can listen in on the conversation or the data stream. Uh, once access has been achieved, the attacker then can copy data uh, from the device if the device is left on or if it is configured to uh, allow access to the kernel or to the operating system or to file shares through Bluetooth. So uh, radio frequency identification and near field communication, NFC and RFID, are also wireless technologies that require a user to bring uh, a client close to an AP in order to verify something. RFID is used all the time in warehousing and stocking and logistics, very common. Uh, this can be leveraged uh, for 
um, a lot of different types of fraud. And um, another thing that we can use RFID jammers for that you see uh, criminals using is RFID is used a lot in uh, retail for uh, loss prevention. Uh, so you've seen those those uh, things at the entrances and exits and exits of a store. Uh, that is kind of a neat near field communication or RFID uh, uh, trap. So if it sees a signal from an RFID tag, it can then trigger a alarm. So you see when people leave Walmart or Target and alarms go off or whatever, and some a security guard goes up to them and like checks their uh, bag, checks their receipt, their, that RFID uh, tag may not have been um, deactivated at the register. Uh, you can get uh, field dampeners uh, for uh, near-field communication or an RFID that will jam the RFID signal, and what criminals will do is they will hold those or have them in uh, their backpack or uh, bag or something, and it will disrupt that uh, RFID signal in order for it to attempt to uh, throw it off, all right? What uh, companies have done instead is they have a near field uh, communication that actually has the disruptors on the tags now themselves, and when they get a disruption, it fires it off. So they're changing their tactics <clears throat> slightly over the last few years. <clears throat> Disassociation is where the intruder is going to send a frame to an access point and try to bump them off of the network. Disassociation is used in conjunction with WPA2 attacks or WPA attacks in order for the client to reassociate to the access point in order for the uh, hacker to gain the entire communication of the WPA four-way handshake and then therefore capture the WPA, WPA2 hash. So um, there's a good table on page 177 that goes over the wireless tech uh, uh, analogy, and it breaks down all of these different uh, attacks from rogue access points, jamming, interference, a replay attack, evil twin, etc. That table is key. Look at that cape table, read it, memorize it. You will see this again, I promise. So in <clears throat> wrapping this up this week, uh, wireless systems are used everywhere. They're one of the uh, ever more popular um, uh, technologies that you will see. And because of their just inherent nature, they are also very vulnerable and susceptible, especially to denial of service attacks. Uh, on page 178, the exam essentials know that wireless access points extend the reach of a network, know that vulnerabilities of wireless networks, that, that uh, table on page 177, and know the security protocols that are used by 802.11, primarily WPA, WPA2, and the Security Plus exam does not really go and do a deep dive into the protocols uh, for uh, uh, such as EEP, but they do in other pieces of authentication that we see have seen in previous chapters. So uh, one note here as we are gearing up, <clears throat> chapter one through five is what the uh, midterm is going to be covered on. And just a, a note here on the midterm, what you need to be looking for is um, uh, the, the questions in the back of the chapter. Uh, I'll, and I will all, those are really good help uh, topics. I try to go through a lot as I'm going through the chapter. So go back and listen to the lectures. Make sure that you read the chapter. Uh, most all of the questions are going to come out of the book. I will have questions off of Lab 1, the Cisco lab that we did. Uh, there will be a few questions out of that. Um, so we're here in week six now, and the midterm is going to be going to uh, sneak up on us here if we're not careful in the next couple of weeks. I know lecture was rather short this week, but I want to give you some time so you can go back 
and study questions out of the back of the book. Take your quiz uh, this week, and we're going to be jumping uh, headfirst into Lab 2 uh, here in lecture that I will be pushing out here as soon as Thursday. So be on the lookout for that as well. So until next time, this is uh, Professor Brown. We'll see you around.